lacerations one on the left lower limb the other on his uh, forehead and then one on his uh, right forearm medical director of the upper west Virginia hospital dr robert amasia said due to the varied degrees of injuries including him partially blind as a result of gland trauma the surgery and treatment was done in phases and with different surgeons. Exactly what we did was um, the maxillofacial surgeon fixed the jaw and then the, myself, the orthopedic surgeon, I fixed the right radius and ulna, the left ulna, and then we repaired the tendons that uh, were lacerated. How many stamina was it used to, 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 to fix? So this was a combined surgery of uh, orthopedics and uh, maxillofacial, so it took uh, almost two hours to get everything fixed. He said it would take the 43 year old father of three some time for him to recover fully. Um, what I think we need to also work on is um, to have our uh, clinical psychologists also, you know do some therapy on him because if a group of people attack you apart from the physical trauma that uh, you will sustain you have this emotional uh, psychological trauma too so it's a multidisciplinary approach that we are offering him so maxillofacial orthopedics then the clinical psychologist uh, accordingly he alleged that uh, he got also blunt trauma to the eye the ophthalmology unit too is also handling that so we are quite a number of uh, teams that are helping to attend to him so we just hope that together we can support him so that he can get back to his original state Meanwhile, in the Sisala West District capital of Bolu, there was a press conference that was held to counter accusations leveled against the upper West regional minister, Dr. Hafiz Bin Sali, and a host of other regional executives of the MPP on the dastardly and despicable act. The group calling themselves to Majid and led by Hudumwa, first of all, condemned the inhumane and violence attack meted out to the constituency Nasara coordinator. Them that act in no, in no uncertain terms, irrespective of, the, uh, irrespective of the magnitude of the crime he was committing at the time of the night, we believe strongly that he should have just been arrested and handed over to the chief or better still the police. They accused the constituency executives of not being true to their words, but rather engaged in hide and seek with the supporters resulting in the unfortunate class. Unfortunately, they could not complete the exercise and have agreed to start from Desme the next day. The consensus executives rather went to Fatu instead of Desme as agreed with the regional reps. The reps heard of that and cautioned them not to conduct any elections there without their supervision in the interest of fairness but they refused and went ahead with their agenda, which resulted into the clash, the clashes leading to our supporters suffering various degrees of injuries. They also jumped to the defense of the Apostle Minister and the security personnel deployed to the area. The consensus secretary cited security reasons as the, as the basis of not conducting elections at Kunkoko, Kusale, Desme, Puluma, and Kopuluma, and other communities. Now, if the regional minister deploys security to beef up the men on the grounds to support the committee to do their work, does that amount to abuse of power? No. no. Did the constituency secretary know exactly what abuse of power is? No. The constituency executives are aware they will lose this year's election in totality because the good people of Sisala West because the good people of Sisala West MPP are tired of their lies 
fake motor keys, fights, propaganda, and several years of autocratic leadership, st uh, leadership style. Reporting for the news, Rafik Salam. Wa now, information rich in joy news indicates that the police have made some further arrest in connection with the attack. Apo S P R O of the Ghana Police Service, Chief Inspector Gideon Boating is with me on the line now. Um, um, thank you very much, Chief Inspector Boating. Good morning to you. Um, how many people have been picked up now? Good morning, sir. In addition to those two who were arrested initially, mm -hmm. we have arrested additional two who are uh, Ali Du Wajia. Uh, he said he doesn't know his age, but he's a, uh, he's a, he's a former. Mm -hmm. He was a police and a native of Golu mm -hmm. uh, he, he stays at uh, Domiabra, okay. a section of Golu. Then uh, one, uh, Tuman tu, tu Liman, also age 60 years. Uh, yes, he's also a native of. Uh, they go all there, and then he is a farmer also. We are with the police, and we are we are we are interrogating them. Hopefully, we need to arrest additional people because looking at the picture, which was speculated mm -hmm. or circulated, circulated, mm -hmm. quote and unquote, mm -hmm. you know, we need to get more than the four. Okay. So the original police commander, in the person of uh, DCOP, Mr. Peter in the Kugri, mm -hmm. as sent men out there, as I spoke to you yesterday, um, three days ago, and uh, today to men are still on the ground. Intelligence are being gathered for us to, to earn something better than we have achieved. Um, we are assuring the public that they should exercise constraint or restraint because police will not sit down and look for certain things to happen this way. With, yes. regards, to the, with regards to the first suspect who have picked up, have they been put before court already? Yes, please. Uh, the two were, were sent to court yesterday. Uh, court, the upper was, uh, uh, the, 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 the one magistrate court was where we put the people and then uh, before. And then headed, uh, presided over by his, was, his worship, Maxwell, Max the Brain, Titriku. And he reminded them to police custody to reappear on 4th of next month. So the, uh, the, the victim, Waleka uh, Idrisu, now a 45-year-old man, now responded to treatment, and we hope that he, he gained more than he is mm. enjoying now. Uh, but what charges uh, did the police prefer against uh, the suspect? Uh, thanks so much. Uh, we, we slapped them with a charge of attempt to commit crime to wit murder. So mm. that was the charge okay. that we slapped with them with. And then uh, hopefully we will end, as I earlier said, we will end uh, uh, something better out of the investigation that we have, uh, we have so far led into. Okay. Uh, so, so how soon will the new suspect be put before court? Um, since we have gotten them, if worse becomes worse for us, that today we, we are enjoying the weekend from right from today, this evening. Uh, if possible, after taking their statements, and uh, maybe they may, they may be needed to assist police further. Other than that, we need to send them to court, you see, for the court to either remind them or whatever this is in the court to take. You see, mm -hmm. police, we have the court here, but per the instances of the weekend, police need to proceed to court today, hopefully. Uh the, the first, the, the party secretary and uh, the team that did the first press conference were blaming the regional minister for this. Has the police seen any need for the regional minister to be invited for some interrogation? Um, I would say that police, we are investigating a case of causing a non-political affiliated issue. Uh, if, if we deem it right that people come out there to, to tell us that uh, it affiliates to any political something, or whatever, and the minister's hand is under the carpet to, to the perpetrators uh, being uh, uh, molesting people over there. I think we, we need to, because the law doesn't belong to him, neither myself. And therefore, we need to invite him, and that, 
that one will work okay. when the people are very bold enough to come to the police to assess. We need we are investigating the case, and therefore we need we need uh, uh, the, the public uh, uh, assurance and and then assistance. Okay. So we can't base on this. this is a hearsay to me. You know, it's a hearsay to me because I have heard that they said the minister is is part of the decision. Well, who has come to level the case? You know, police to based on at times based on hearsay. We base and then invite some other people, but we okay. want the people, since they have been able to make a press conference, they have to come to police to assist the police to investigate the, the issue, to the bottom. All right. Um, but thank for, you. Now, for now, we are investigating a case of causing harm. Okay. Thank you very much, sir, for joining us here. Now, also joining us on the phone is a relation of the victim, Razak Bagaya, to tell us more about this incident and, and what's happening to the, the, the brother there. Good morning to you very much, Bagaya. Thanks for your time. Now, is Musa still in the hospital? And what's his condition now? Uh, Musa is still in the hospital. Currently, Hello, Bagaya. Yes, I'm listening. I see the police hero is still on the line. Currently, currently Musa is is responding to treatment. Okay. Yeah, now, yeah, now, some, now, so yeah. we, we, are, we, are, we are told that uh, some new two people have been arrested. How does the family react to this latest arrest? Yes, it's a good news to us. We are welcoming the news. But we want justice. Just not a mere arresting. We want justice. That's all what we want. But currently, they have gone surgery on his both forearm yesterday and that of his due that tomorrow tomorrow or monday they will go another surgery for the judge mm. so um, um, and, have you had any interaction with the regional minister on this yes, particular development yes currently we are the uh, regional minister minister office currently as i'm speaking we went to meet the minister. For we, the family, we don't have problem with the minister. Because when the incident happened, he is the first person to call on us. And he has been supporting us with the money. And he's assuring us the deal is going to take care of all the bills. So I think this morning we meet him and we greet him for what he has been doing for us. But we are calling on him to do justice. We want justice. That's okay. all we want. Because this thing is internal policy. We are not, we the family are not part. We are not accusing the minister of anything. What we want is justice. We are just calling upon him to help us get justice. Okay. Yes. Um, uh, but but, but I, I'm sure your brother has a wife and children. How are they also reacting to all of this development? Yes. They are... In fact, the wife, the wife is in the traumatic situation because currently is pregnant and is almost due for delivery. And imagine what will happen if your wife gets to hear this happen to a husband. So currently we are all at the hospital together with the wife. So we are praying and hoping our brother will get better. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Bagaya, uh, for your time. He is a brother to the NASA coordinator of the Upper West region who has been um, uh, beating and is responding to treatment in the hospital. Moving on to other stories, the Environmental Protection Agency, EPA, is conducting market surveillance in the Ashanti region to check the sale of DDT-infected watermelon. A survey by scientists at the KNUST reviewed watermelons on the market had high levels of the banned chemical. Children have been found to be at high risk of suffering adverse health effects if they consume the fruit regularly. Speaking to my colleague Benjamin Akapo on the AM show this morning, Chief Executive Officer of the EPA, Henry Kwabena Kokofu, said the agency is uh, taking up the matter. Get to know the abuse and top abuse of uh, um, medicine, uh, whether herbal or um, sort of. So be any other uh, substances or products that we find ourselves in. EDT, as it were, the full name is dichlorodiphenyl trichloroethane. It is uh, a, a pesticide, and it is among the number of pesticides that has been found in this country for long. 
the use of it, the importation of it has been banned. And it is in conjunction with the Stockholm Convention that sought to uh, internationally ban the use of all the basic uh, chloride things, uh, uh, if, if, you, if you like. Now, the use of pesticides in general has been uh, uh, something that as a nation we need to look at it uh, critically. Uh, you rightly said that uh, there may be uh, an unbanned substance uh, use as pesticides, but as to the volume, as to the percentage, the usage, uh, uh, the, 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 the method or the uh, uh, procedure or the processes through which these uh, uh, substances are to be used uh, is lacking. And that is squarely the lack of knowledge in all these uh, directions. That's why we've been advocating for farm extension officers who uh, have requested knowledge in these things to be on the farms to educate farmers on the use of these uh, materials. But, uh, but all of that, all, all of that, you see, I, I was saying shortly before you joined the conversation that the buck must stop somewhere. We know yeah. it is banned. Why, why is it even accessible? Because once it's accessible, people will use it. And, and why isn't there the right education on these pesticides so that they will not even be used? Because from the discussion, the thread shows that a lot of these farmers don't even understand what they are doing. Some are even tasting the pesticide. That's how dangerous it is. Yes, um, the, the, it's banned. So officially, uh, we don't expect this importation in the system. However, you and I do the smuggling of uh, most of these contraband goods into our, our, our society or onto our land. And through the various illegal uh, routes of entry uh, at our borders, the closeness of our borders, we all are aware of. We've been doing uh, and taking uh, steps to do uh, something on the market to try to check some of these things. But uh, it, it's, it's unfortunate, uh, and people are so recalcitrant and we always want to do. We want to invite the uh, researchers. Uh, we want to know more and further uh, so we can close in on exactly where the, the, the findings uh, are or, or what they found it, uh, so that we'll be able to by way of recommendation, also get down there. Now, this morning, agitations on the labor front is in focus uh, as organized labor is asking for a 19% increase in salaries with members of CLOCSA demanding payment of neutrality allowance. Government has already indicated that the economy is in challenging times, but the union say hikes in prices of goods and services means their salaries can no longer meet their needs. Meanwhile, the Secretary of the, the Secretary General of the Trade Union Congress, Dr. Yao Ba, has vowed workers will be uncompromising with the demand. So the job crisis, you know, predates you know Ukraine. The job crisis came before COVID. Therefore, we think that it is not right to blame COVID and Ukraine for every job crisis that we have in this country. That is not right. And we are not going to accept that. The Trade Union Congress, which is leading organized labor, is very cautious and we always are biased towards dialogue. We hardly want to strike because strike is a very difficult thing to do. It's like war. So before we declare war on the employers, we have to make sure we have good reason. This time, we have the good reason to do it. Therefore, we caution that the employers must listen to us. And they should not just listen, they should also hear us. Because the workers of this country are suffering too much. And we should not allow it to continue. Those who are in charge of this country must know that without workers, this country cannot progress. We have the National Tripartite Committee. The National Tripartite Committee has started the process towards determining the minimum wage for this year. For us, that is a do and die. We are going to make sure that minimum wage for workers for this year should not be below inflation. And this will be extended to public sector workers as well. So there's a battle ahead of us. And I can see organized labor is ready to fight. And we are going to do that. 
Well, let's broaden this discussion and join uh, an economist, uh, Dr. Patrick Assuming. He is with us on Zoom. Doc, thank you for your time. With the state of the economy in mind, how must government approach such discussions and should labor not be compromising? Good morning and good morning to viewers. Um, you know, I, I, at this point, the, the economy is not in uh, the strongest position it can be in. Um, and the government finances are a little bit tight, are very tight at this moment. So I think, I mean, a lot of these agitations have come about because uh, the macroeconomic environment has deteriorated. Mm. Um, the inflation is, the current inflation is 19.4. Uh, and uh, over the last uh, nine months or so, inflation has been in double digits. And then as you are aware, the public sector wages uh, that increment that was agreed some time back was about 7% for this year. So obviously, you can understand why labor is agitating because the inflation has been eroding away the, the, their wages. So real wages would have gone down. Mm. I think uh, on one hand, government needs to, you know, come up with something convincing that, you know, the macroeconomic environment will stabilize. I think if we were at a situation where inflation was uh, lower single digit. I don't think uh, labor would be arguing as uh, would be agitating as much as it's doing. In the meantime, it appears that they may have to agree to uh, maybe some uh, moderate increment. But I think a 19% increase is not something that the government finances can contain at this moment. Well, well but, but if you look at how the or where the inflation rate is. And, and you give anything less than, then you are making them worse off because prices of goods are up there and their salary is down there. Well, I understand that, but you know you have to understand that the inflation over the last 12 months has not been 19%. Uh, yes, it is increasing. So I think if the inflation stays this high for long, then, I mean, a demand for something like that will seem justified. This is not to say that labor has... You know, labor doesn't have an argument. They don't have a point demanding that, uh, you know, their salaries are increased. But I think you have to, you know, in some sense, you have to see the circumstances in which we are and then see whether it is, it is feasible for government to, to, to see to that demand. I think some moderate increments maybe the government could afford, but I, I doubt that the government can afford to raise a public sector Wages by organized uh, wages by that nineteen percent. In in that case, what can government do to also ensure it is making life comfortable for 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 labor? Because if inflation rate is this high and the labor's uh, salary is is that low or the, the minimum wage is that low, it still does not make up for the labor. So how does government approach this to ensure that there is a win win affair and, and not make labor worse off? or to still say that government, even if you can't, we still need it? So I think um, maybe government needs to uh, negotiate and meet with labor and negotiate with, uh, in all sincerity and uh, show a lot of candor and then also appreciate that indeed um, the recent circumstances has not been uh, fair to organize labor and not to just try and, uh, you know, First of all, once, once you hear these agitations, you obviously have to, uh, you know, approach them and uh, meet and uh, try and uh, at least let them know that uh, you share their concerns. I think that that one will help. And uh, organized labor seems that, I mean, they seem reluctant to accept that uh, the challenges uh, are related to the recent issues in uh, Ukraine. I think there has to be some meeting and there has to be some negotiation. I think it will help if... Labor was convinced that the recent uh, inflation numbers, or there's something to convince Labor that going forward, the conditions will improve. The overall economic circumstances in the country will improve because that's really what it is. If you recall that last year, the wage increase that was given to Labor is lower than we are having this year. Yeah. But mm -hmm. we didn't see this much agitation. So it clearly tells you that the fact that the economic conditions are worsening is the main thing that is driving this agitation. So. If, you know, the organized labor was convinced that things are going to improve going forward and uh, maybe government meet them some part of the way, maybe it, it, it might, they might find that acceptable. But 
if they are not convinced and they believe that conditions are going to keep getting worse, then I'm sure they'll be reluctant to, to accept. But clearly, if you look at the, the state that we are in, I don't think that government finances can support that much mm. wage increase. Which means that labor should be compromising, right? Absolutely. All right. Thank you very much, Doc, for your time here. Now, uh, moving on to other stories here on News Desk. The Education Minister is asking grade A schools to learn to accept students with low grades and mold them into good students capable of passing their West African Secondary School Certificate Examination, WASI. According to the Minister, Dr. Yaose Edichum, that's the best way to assess how best these schools really are. Speaking at the launch of the University of Cape Coast at 60 celebrations in Cape Coast, the minister said always receiving the best basic education certificate examination student and making score good WASI great does not make them the best schools. But he stated that, re that receiving students with low grade and guiding them to pass their WASI will make their schools stand out. Richard Kodjonyako was there and asked more in this report. The Education Minister, Dr. Oseya Wedichum, indicated that the mark of every good teacher, every good school is to get students with low grades and turn them into outstanding students. He challenged the grade A schools in the country like Wesley Girls, Presec, Holy Child and the likes not to be worried when students with low grades are placed in their schools, but be happy that with their resources, pedigree and experience, such students will be guided and molded into excellent students that are capable of passing their final exams. There are families where Nobody has ever gone to senior high school. And if we don't go there, and we continue to look at ourselves, and begin to complain, why are we bringing all these children here? There are places where teachers are complaining that students with aggregate 20 are being accepted. I had a wonderful conversation with some man who is very high up called me one day and said, why are you sending students with aggregate 22 to Presec? And I said, sir, I, I think Presec has one of the best group of teachers in this country. He said, yes, it's true, Presec, yeah, that's my school. <laughs> and he said, yeah, they are examiners and they are very good. And I said, yeah, sir, I know. They are examiners and they are very good. So they are the ones who are prepared to teach those who have aggregate 25. The idea that students who are grade 25 should not go to Presec, it boggles my mind. They are the ones who belong to Wesley Girls where you have talented teachers. So if Wesley Girls want to prove to me that they are the best school and they are the best school, they need to take in students who are grade 20. He fed a child the University of Cape Coast to set a pace in training teachers that would handle children with special needs in Ghana. I want you to begin to reassess your a new frontier, a new frontier where you take charge of education of teachers for special needs children. Special needs children, autistic children that will need some speech therapy. Our nation is in short supply of speech therapists. Cape Coast must lead the way. You must lead the way in the training of education psychologists, those who can support our teachers in the education of our children. You must lead the way in STEM education, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, and I love it. Uh, that's why I'm sponsoring about 97 of our STEM professionals. Um, I believe that we can do better as a nation by increasing the percentage of our students who are in these fields. Doing very well in other fields, but when it comes to STEM, we are found wanting. And especially when it comes to gender parity. At the Kwame Nkrumah University of Technology, Science and Technology, uh, leaders of engineering, only 15% of the engineering students are women, and it's not good enough. We can do better. Dr. Osei Duchum explained that government would never compromise on quality in its bid to open access to senior high school education. 
Vice Chancellor of the University of Cape Coast, Professor Johnson Yakobo Ampo, indicated that currently the university's collective image as an institution is high, and across the sub region and across the globe, the university's reputation is very high and ought to be protected. As the Vice Chancellor of this great institution, I see this as the beginning of greater things yet to come. It is therefore important that we work harder to overcome our challenges so that we can maintain our enviable position as a top-ranked university in Ghana, West Africa, and global leader in terms of our research influence. He stated that globally, the university is not only being recognized for its academic excellence, but as a pace setter in higher education as well. The 60th anniversary cake of the university was cut to begin the activities he marked for the celebration. Reporting for Joy News, Richard Kwejenya Akon, Cape Coast. Thank you very much. Yes, news desk here on Joy News. We'll take a quick break. We will return with more news. It's time now for business. I am Beverly Broom. The Ghana Revenue Authority says its systems are all set to begin tax deductions from electronic transactions starting May, despite a legal suit by the minority of parliament challenging the validity of the passage of the levy and an injunction on its implementation. The authority insists implementation takes effect next month. Here is Commissioner General of the Ghana Revenue Authority, Reverend Dr. Amisha Dai Owusu Amwa. Uh, currently, uh, I would say that um, if if, I, if I'm saved mm. and I'm, when an injunction is I mean, put on us, um, we will comply with what the injunction says. But as of now, I cannot say that um, we are have stopped in terms of our tracks to. Um, have you deliver. been served with any injunction from filed by persons who have issues with this levy and they don't want it to go ahead? Has the authority been served? I have not been served as at this moment. As a commissioner, you have not been served. So therefore, the, everything is going ahead? Yes. What are your legal advisors telling you on this? Go ahead. Or you could be cited with contempt. I think that um, for this one, we as January have not been mentioned um, in terms of, when I say they have not been mentioned, even though the, the, the injunction or the um, what you call the application does mention a restriction on GRE to progress. You know, it is the duty of the Attorney General, who is the representative of the, um, the government as far as the um, uh, laws and then government agencies are concerned. And therefore, if I am advised uh, by the Attorney General to do any other thing, I will comply with what advice I do Have receive. they given you any advice that CG hold on? I, I said if I am advised, mm. so it means that... You've not <laughs> done that. Has, has the authority also tried to seek any advice from them? I said, what is the legal advice in going ahead with this, the preparation towards this time as well? I think that, I mean, um, I want to leave the details of whatever conversation that mm. I am having. But definitely, as a CEO of the organization, if I hear of anything that affects the organization, I'll have to do calls here and there to find out what is happening and to be able to be advised. So I will not be in the position to mention specifically whatever I have done. Mm -hmm. But I can only say that if I am advised by the legal authority or the um, person responsible for advising us, to re restrain or to um, from moving forward, we will be comply. But as I actually speak right now, things are moving on. Yes, as as the as yes. The country's tax revenue in relation to the size of the economy is expected to grow this year by nearly two percent to sixteen point five percent. That's according to the International Monetary Fund's latest fiscal monitor report. However, despite the drastic cut in government expenditure for this year, spending in relation to the total value of the economy will fall marginally. Charles Nixon Yeboah has been going through the data. 
So the International Monetary Fund April 2022 fiscal monitor is actually forecasting that Ghana's tax to GDP ratio will nearly increase by 2% to 16.5%. And that comes as a good news for the country. This means that the various revenue measures by the finance ministry is going to yield positive results. On the other hand, going forward into the future, we expect the managers of the economy to do more to be able to increase the tax to GDP ratio to the African average of about 20%. We also expect them to reduce spending. And if they are able to do that, we'll be good to go in terms of helping to trim our debt to our debt because the rising debt is a concern for the country. If the debt keeps rising, it will be very difficult for us to have fiscal space in order to invest in very critical projects that will yield uh, results, i.e. job creation and infrastructure development. So on a whole, this is what the International Monetary Fund is saying with regard to the assessment by its fiscal monitor. And um, the good news is that Ghana's tax to GDP ratio would somehow expand to some extent, but uh, the tax to the expenditure to tax ratio is what is of a concern, and that will not fall as expected, and will keep the fiscal deficit to GDP ratio at 9.8%. That's all for business. For more business news, kindly log on to myjoyonline.com for slash business. Up next is sports. We bring you sports. Let's uh, do this story. Ramadan is seen as a spiritual time for reflection, improvement, and increased devotion and worship of Allah. During this period, adult Muslims do not eat nor drink from dawn to dusk. Even though children of the Muslim faith are expected to begin fasting once they have reached puberty, usually by the age of 14, many are encouraged to do so even before they attain this age. In a following report, my colleague Anna Sabit has been interacting with some children below the fasting age on how they first embarked on this important religious journey. Muslim children typically aren't expected to fast during Ramadan until they reach puberty. But most often, kids will want to start earlier because they see everyone else abstaining from food and water from sunrise to sunset, followed by their community gathering to break their fast together and they want to participate. Today, I set off to engage some of these kids on how they began observing the dawn to dusk religious obligation. 14-year-old Fatih Dries was nine when she first attempted to fast. When I started fasting, we were staying in Accra. When we went to school, I saw my friends fasting. So when I came home, I told, I told my mom that I also wanted to fast. So in the morning, I, when I finished eating, I did my chores. Exactly eight, then my stomach started growing. Then I went to the kitchen and saw some jollof. <laughs> but I, I controlled myself. But when it was 12, I couldn't control myself anymore and I drank water. Unlike Fatih Idris, who started at age 9, Abdulaziz Issa's first fasting experience was at age 13. I myself wanted to fast because it was good. All my friends were doing it and I was told that when you do, you receive blessing from Allah. Like most of the kids I spoke with, nine-year-old Shurem is fasting for the first time this year. He attempted to do so a year ago but failed to make it to sunset. I was hungry. I, I, I was crying for help. And when I was in the room, I went to tell my, my stepmother that I'm hungry. She said I should wait. Until the time will go to 12. I waited and get, it came to 12. And, and I break the fast. Kids can start by fasting for a few hours, by fasting from dawn to midday, by skipping lunch, or by fasting only on weekends. Hajia Hajarakipu is a mother of four. 
She shares with me how she nurtures her children into fasting. For children and fasting, in fact, it is something interesting because I started with my children at the age of five. And at the age of five, the child will not fast fully, but the child will fast from morning to 12 o'clock at that age then I'll ask the child to break the fast and when you are doing this you don't let you don't have to let the child go to school you have to let the child do it at the weekend so normally they do it at the fast at weekends so when the child is at, is at home you can monitor the child the way the child is feeling when you see the child being weak or lying down he can't do anything then maybe you have to let the child break the fast. Hajara is however surprised at how her case took to fasting pretty easily and didn't appear to be overly exhausted, adding that Muslim children are not forced but trained gradually to do so. It's not forced. We don't force the children, but we rather give them training. It's a training. Like I said, the children themselves, it will get to us some time, Kura. When you ask them to fast today, tomorrow, don't fast, you have to rest. The child will say, no, mommy, I want to fast. Or daddy, allow me to fast. Me, I can fast. I can fast today, even time. Allow me to fast. So it's not force. We don't force them. We train them. And when you train your child well, the child will like to fast with you. To these children have been engaging, what else do they know about Ramadan aside from abstaining from food and water? I was nine when I started fasting, and nobody forced me to fast. I, I saw that everyone was fasting and nothing happened to them. And I also wanted to fast so that I can get blessings from Allah. You pray the five day of prayers and you recite the Quran and help the needy people. Though Muslims are only mandated to fast at puberty, getting children encouraged to fast early remains of significant importance to most Muslim homes. Reporting for Joy News, Anna Sabit, Tichiman. So welcome back from that story. Now uh, joining me in studio is a Muslim brother, Muftau. <laughs> What's sports? Muftau, good morning. Good morning. How are you? I'm good. When did you, at what age did you start fasting? Like 13, 14, I, I had actually grown. Because you grew up, you're always with people who are always fast, fasting. When you are eating, they were laughing at you. So, <laughs> so you, actually, you actually also had to fast. So yeah, okay. that was when I started fasting. It wasn't under compulsion. No, it but was But just that you felt people were mocking yeah, you. Yeah, no, it's not just the, the mocking alone, but okay. it was always weird. Mm -hmm. Now you are, you are in the house, and usually during the fasting, if you're someone who, who is very often, there will not be food for you to eat. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you just also fast and follow food. Oh, wow. Yeah, Interesting. yeah because in the house, early morning, when we wake up in the dawn, you've all eaten. Mm. Uh, they will clear the bowls. There are mm. empty bowls standing there. Unless, of course, you have so many children around the house that there will okay. be food. But if you don't have so many children around the house, trust me, you, you will go hungry. But, but how's it going? Oh, it's been pretty cool, but at this point, it's not very normal. <laughs> <laughs> it's very normal. I, okay. Was it just a couple of, um, mm. was it two days ago, mm -hmm. and um, Benjamin Akako was like, ah, you, are you sure you're fasting now? <laughs> <laughs> Why, because you're looking too fresh or yeah, something? Yeah, yeah, like, ah, okay. you don't know Spiritual wonders, anyway. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. so what's up in sports? I hear how to is going through some financial yes, difficulties. Yes, yes. But how come that's happening? Because I know the vice president, yes. I was told the uh, minority leader, yeah. all of these MPs from the northern, yeah, were helping. So how come? Oh, well, they are at a point that um, there's so much politics happening within the team, oh. uh, where many people feel that um, their contribution to, into the team is not being appreciated. For instance, we were made to understand that the former MPA boss uh, Hassan Tampuli had donated about fifty thousand Ghana cedis to the club, so that they were used to pay the, the salaries of players. But all these things were not captured. They, they go about talking about other people who contribute without talking about the others who also contribute. Oh, okay. And there's one interesting thing about RTU. The support base of the team is such that 
whoever is throwing money into the team mm. gets their support. So, for instance, if you have someone like the minority leader supporting the team, mm -hmm. there's a likelihood that a chunk of the support, mm -hmm. he gave them 100,000 Ghana cities, and then Hassan Tampoli also gave them 50,000 Ghana cities. So but, but, so, once the story about their financial state went out there, who has moved in to say, I want to help? No one has actually come in yet. Um, they are still talking to people. Um, he actually revealed that the chief executive officer actually decided to use his land as collateral for their last Premier League game. So, <laughs> <laughs> so collateral for what? Was it for, for tomorrow? Yeah, had, tomorrow? No, yes, tomorrow money. He had to use his land. So to they can have that last game. So they can use the money to play that game. Now they're at a point they need to travel to Elmina to come up against Elmina Sharks. Wow. So they have to find a different way. We are meant to understand that someone is trying to speak to the vice president on their behalf mm. so that he could come to their aid. We, we, we await um, the outcome of that meeting. But well, what about, it looks like we're saying, but, but there's a serious matter there. Yeah. What about former players like Abedi Ayupele, who... I bet that you, Pele, mm -hmm. is not that figure who is always out within the public domain. Okay. Uh, okay. So I cannot tell whether if they have spoken to okay. him or not. Okay. Uh, maybe if they come to speak to him, his, maybe his children will even help. All right. Um, moving away from the RT issue yes. and to, say, foreign land. Yes. What, I mean, yesterday we had the... I, I don't want to up my anticipation. Um, Are you a United fan? I am. I mean, full-blooded one. Apart so from, you, you, apart you from celebrate my, history, isn't it? I do. So, but the, the past without, glory of my United States is what history, is keeping you close with, to the Without team. history, I, I'm not asking the questions. <laughs> no, without history, where will we be? History is there to guide us on how, what we do for tomorrow. So yes, history is important. Okay. And everybody knows that the most successful club from England and, and Britain is us, Manchester. I mean, no doubt about it. There's, there's no, no, so I shouldn't tag you. No, no, no. You but, but, but I can choose to say Liverpool. Oh, no, no. I mean, Liverpool. They've I mean, won the Champions League five, times? six times. Uh, it's not, it's not. Five or six times. How many times have Man United won the Champions Three. League? Hmm? Three. That's yeah. half but, of what... But when, when they won... Okay, now let's, they, now let's talk about the coach, if Anyway. <laughs> we are told Ten Hag has been uh, recruited. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the club has actually confirmed him. I am, I am, I am I'm only managing my expectation, really, because of what has happened in the past. Okay. But what does he bring on board? He brings... A philosophy that has to do with giving young players an opportunity, mm. right? Mm. In his, the last four years where he's been with Ajax, we've seen the incredible stories Ajax have told in European football. Mm. <laughs> you are smiling because of the success you are with. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> whether it will translate to Manchester United is a well, uh, there's, a, there's that possibility. I think that mm -hmm. the bigger problem of Manchester United is the board and the management. If the board and the management are committed to investing into the club, there should be new signings to augment the squad. You are really going to be very competitive. In the last couple of years, my United have not been competitive because their choice of signings have been horrendous. Look at what Liverpool have done. They can take a cue from that. And that's why we've sat the uh, head of the, the, the scouting team. They should go. Let's build our team. And that's how we wrap up this edition of uh, the News Desk. My name is Samuel Kojo Grace. Uh, Muftao came up with this post there. Do enjoy the rest of your morning. But do log on to uh, myjournline.com for the news.